Hello everyone, my name is Vova and today I'm going to talk about physics and physics uh, and game engine. So, but before that, a uh, quick introduction. So, I've been doing some software development stuff for 10 years now and during that time I wrote approximately two physics engines. So, today my goal is to teach you how can you create your own physics engine in just a few simple steps and few years of your life. But before we do that, uh, let's quickly check on existing physics engine to see how they work and what's wrong with them. So physics, unlike rendering, uh, stayed pretty much the same uh, since Quake 2 era. And this is because two reasons. The first of all, uh, physics laws haven't changed uh, much since 1990s. So you still need pretty much the same stuff. You still need gravity, you still need collisions, frictions, and so on. A uh, second uh, point is that uh, physics is designed to be invisible. Physics uh, is here just to not annoy the player, do its stuff. Uh, so uh, when you start building a new game, usually it's a good idea to choose an uh, old, well-tested uh, physics engine not to start to write physics from scratch. But uh, you can obviously do it if you want to have some fun. Uh, so here we have a bunch of existing 3D engines and 2D engines are on the right side, uh, with most famous being Box2D. And there's 3D engines on the left side with most famous perhaps physics. And uh, there is an important thing to notice here. And the thing is that there is no such stuff as physics engine. You will either get a 2D physics or 3D physics. Uh, and if uh, for whatever reason you need uh, both physics in your games, uh, you, in your game you will need two physics engines and those physics engines just won't interact with each other. So your 3D stuff will go straight away from straight through uh, your 2D stuff. Uh, so you kind of ca can kind of get away uh, by simulating uh, both 2D and 3D worlds in using just 3D engines, but uh, because you obviously can just throw away the third dimension, pretend that it doesn't exist, make everything flat. And uh, that leads us to the question, why do we even need to have 3D physics? Uh, 2D physics, if you have, can just learn one 3D engine. And the answer to this question is that dimensions are hard. So here you can see a comparison chart for 2D box versus 3D cube. And 2D box have only one uh, plane, which is the box itself. And 3D cube have six planes. Uh, box have four edges, while cube have 12 edges. And what is uh, most important here is uh, that box have only three degrees of freedom. Box can move up and down, this is the first degree of freedom. Box can move left to right, this is the second degree of freedom. And can, box can rotate, this is the third degree of freedom. While the cube has six degree of freedom, so cube can additionally move uh, backwards and forwards, and it also has two additional axes to rotate around. And this is a huge difference in terms of computational resources. So 3D physics can be like 10, 20, 30 times slower than 2D1. So if you have a pure 2D game, you better to invest in learning 2D engine and your users will send you later. Okay, let's uh, take a look on some basic APIs that physics engine are providing us. And physics engine are not reali reality because reality is hard. Everything is made bunch of particles, waves and so on. And if you ask your 3D designer to make a car from like billions of particles and waves, they will probably politely refuse to do so. Uh, so uh, what we need here is uh, a good enough simulation of our real life. And in order to do that, we will uh, get a few building blocks. And the first building block is a physics body. And physics body can be found in pretty much any physics engine out there. A uh, physics body is just a point in space, which have mass or density. It has drag. Uh, drag defines how fast a body moves, uh, loses energy when it moves through space. 
uh, it has friction which uh, defines how fast body of this energy will interact with the of the body. It has bounciness, which is bounciness. It has constraints, like you can prevent it from moving along x-axis or something like that. And the physics body is just your, like your own body, because your body is not your legs, not your arms, not your head. Your body is something invisible that connects everything together. And physics body is actually connecting colliders. So, uh, in this analogy, colliders are your arms, your legs, and your head. And physics body holds it together. Uh, uh, colliders define the shape of physics body, defines volumes, and colliders actually colliding between each other. Uh, in physics world, we have uh, pretty uh, basic colliders, not legs, not arms, but spheres, boxes, capsules, planes. But you can have uh, mesh colliders, which can have any form you want, but it will cost you a lot in runtime. The third uh, building block uh, is joints. Joints uh, are what is uh, holding stuff together. Bodies, uh, joints defines how bodies interact with each other. So the simplest example of joint in real wor world is nail. So if you want two objects to stick to each other, you just nail them. And the uh, a nail in physics world is a fixed joint. You can have hinges and hinge joints. So hinges are usually used to connect doors to door frame, but your elbow is still a hinge. So exactly like that. You can have springs, which are springs, and you have can have six degree of freedom joints. Six degree of freedom joints are highly configurable joints, which can be used to define rules on how joints should behave on every degree of freedom. So you can, for example, uh, tell that along x-axis two bodies should be five meters apart, along y-axis they can move freely and they can like rotate 30 degrees uh, around the axis. Something like that. And the last building block of any physics engine is queries and callbacks, which is your senses. So what you can do in physics engine? First of all, you can cast something on the scene. So uh, you can cast ray, you can cast box or sphere, something like that. Uh, for example, if you want to know what's under your cursor in your game, you can cast a ray uh, and the start point of ray will be a cursor position and the direction of the ray will be the direction of your camera. You see what uh, this ray hits and this is what under your cursor. You can also get notification when two objects collide. Uh, and for example, if your player collides with lava, obviously, is dead. Uh, and that's pretty much it, I believe. Yes, that's it. Uh, so using just those building blocks, you can create even complex game. And actually, complex game are created just using this block. So let's get to the fun part, where we are building our own physics engine. But before we do that, we need to discuss the reality we live in, reality of physics engine, because, as I said, it's not like our own reality. And the first difference is uh, particles. We already discussed that there are no particles, there are no waves inside the physics engine. And in the real world, if you have a ball and you throw it in onto the ball, uh, the particles in the ball will collide with particles on the floor, stuff will happen, ball will, ball will just bounce back. You don't have to do any math to do it. It just happens automatically. In physics engine, if you have ball, which is basically a sphere, nothing will happen automatically because there is no particles. You need to do all the math for yourself. So the second difference is that we are constantly dealing with situation, situations which just doesn't happen in real life. So no one ever stuck in a wall in real life because it's just impossible. There are no physics law uh, which tell us what to do in this case. But in physics engine world, it's completely possible to happen all the time. So you could just take your player, drag inside the wall, and here you go. In the physics engine, uh, it's your responsibility to fix this stuff. And the third difference is time. So in real world, time is kind of continuous. Well, actually, it's not. Uh, you can take plan constant, do some math with it, and came, uh, came up with a minimum quantum of time which is shown on the upper formula. Uh, and this quantum of time uh, tells us 
the minimum amount of difference between two events in real world. And it almost zero, so it's so small, have absolutely no effect on your life whatsoever. Uh, when we are talking about physics, we are usually run at 60 FPS. So one frame took around 16 milliseconds, and it is a huge time. So if you have a fast moving object in 16 milliseconds, it can go from here to Krakow, probably even back. So you need to keep this in mind as well. Okay, let's now create a master plan, how our physics engine will work. And as I promise you, it's just three simple steps. First of all, we need to find what is wrong with our world, because uh, every time there's something wrong, something is colliding, even when you start a game, artists uh, kind of put stuff wrong and something is colliding something, you need to find what is wrong. Then you need to fix it, obviously. And then you need to st move stuff around, because the physics engine is still your responsibility to move stuff. You need to apply gravity, you need to apply velocity, and so on. And while we're doing the third step, we won't um, take into account anything. We will just move stuff. So if you have a boot which is close to the wall, and you move it, you won't interact with the wall in any way possible. So you just advance simulation at that time. So what can happen here, uh, world can go straight into the wall. And what we're gonna do about it? Nothing. We just wait for next frame, find out that bullet is inside the wall and fix it. So in this regards, physics engine just endless loop of fixing and creating collisions. And uh, we can only hope that we are fixing more collisions that we are creating. Uh, and also important note here is that physics engine doesn't do anything until there is a problem, until it's too late. So first of all, collision should happen, and after that we will act on it, not the other way around. We don't care about future collisions, we just care about current ones. Okay, step one, find out what's wrong with the stuff. And if you think about it, there are two sources of wrongness uh, in your scene. First is obvious collisions, so if your player is stuck inside the wall, this is a problem and you should fix it. Second one are joints. Second one is joints. So uh, joints are basically a user-defined constraint on the world. So a joint can tell us that objects should be like five meters apart. And if objects are six meters apart, here you go, you have a problem. You need to fix it as a physics engine. So let's take a look on some details. Okay, uh, so uh, step one, find out what's wrong with joint. Empty slide, because it's obvious. If your joint tells us that objects should be five meters away and they are six meters away, here you go, you already find out what's wrong with them. And it's just five meters away, nothing wrong, nothing to do here. So yeah, here you go, first step is completed successfully. Um, find out what's wrong with collisions and it's much more tricky. So here you have a uh, box, you have a circle and triangle. Triangle and circle is collided. So in order to find out that triangle and circle is colliding as a physics engine, you need to check um, every object against each other. So you ne need to check that cube uh, box is colliding with the circle, box is colliding with triangle, is and circle colliding with the triangle. And in order to do that, you just need to have some mass. And it's not a rocket science, you can Google it or you can find it in your mass textbook. So it is fine. But unfortunately, this is not enough. Because just knowing that circle and triangle is a colliding gives us absolutely nothing. And if we get back to our joint example, when we talked about what's wrong with joint, we already uh, said uh, exactly what is wrong, and we already said exactly how we should fix it. Because when we are talking, the joint uh, defines that two bodies should be five meters away, and they are six meters away. What you should do in order to fix that, just move stuff closer, one meter, and you're okay. When we uh, talk about circle, which is closing the triangle, what should we do with it? Well, the obvious solution will be to move uh, triangle a bit down and circle a bit up. 
but uh, there is no such word as obvious in math world. So another solution will be to move triangle to the right, closer to me, and circle to the left. Or you can even keep circle in place and move triangle like 100 meters away. So uh, we need an additional piece of information for that. And this piece of information is collision area or collision volume if you're dealing with 3D stuff. So in this example, collision area is an area of a triangle which are located inside of a circle and vice versa, it's the same areas. And uh, just remember this, I will talk about this a little bit later, how we can use collision area or collision volume in order to make a reasonable decision on how to resolve this collision. Okay, let's now get our hands dirty in some implementation. And uh, in real life physics engines, this first step is implemented into two phases. First phase is called broad phase, and it is responsible to just uh, determine what is colliding with what. And second, uh, second phase is called narrow phase, and its uh, purpose is to find out what collision volume we have for this particular collision. So, first step sounds pretty easy. We need just to check every object against every object and be done. We have all the collision pairs. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot do this because uh, games are run in 60 FPS, each frame took 16 milliseconds, and physics is not the most important part of this uh, process, so physics usually get one or two milliseconds to run. And if you have 1,000 uh, object on the scene, with a, which is pretty reasonable amount, you will need to have one million checks. And uh, math for that is not exactly complicated, but moderately complicated. And we just cannot afford to have one million moderately complicated checks just to see what's colliding with what, just not feasible. So uh, we will need to come up with some hacks. And the first hack of the day will be to uh, wrap everything in boxes. So instead of checking whether two objects are colliding, we will wrap those objects in boxes. And those box sh boxes uh, should have the smallest size, size, but they should cover all of our shape. Uh, and those boxes will be aligned with our axis. So th those boxes are called axis align bounding box. Uh, yeah, in, in order to check whether two axis line bounding boxes are intersecting, you need to project them into axis. I uh, won't go into in any details here, but you basically need to have uh, six uh, checks in order to see whether they intersect or not. Uh, that will give us fo some false positive because boxes are bigger than uh, our shapes. But this is not an issue, we'll deal with it later when we're calculating uh, collision volume. So if volume is equal to zero, then basically we have a false positive. So, now, instead of having one million complicated checks, we have one million simple checks. But this is still not good enough, so let's throw in some more hacks, like we can divide our world into pieces, into cells, assign every object to a cell, uh, or to multiple cells if uh, this object is lying on a border or something. Uh, and uh, after that, we only need, need to check uh, uh, check the pair of colliding objects if they belong to the same cell. It may or may not work depending on uh, the size of your world. Uh, maybe everything is located in the center of the same cell, so you will still end up with a million checks. And you can throw in even more hacks to make the sizes of the cells different, bigger or smaller. Uh, won't go into in any details here, but hopefully you get the point. Okay, now we have a pairs of colliding objects. We need to find out the intersection volume. And this is a responsibility of the narrow phase. Uh, and there are more complications here, as you probably uh, see on the slide. Uh, so the algorithm to find out the uh, intersection volumes are available. Universal ones, like, it's called GGK, also have some other algorithm, but as any uh, anything universal, those algorithms are pretty slow. And what you 
inevitably will end up doing here is to just have hundreds and hundreds of algorithms just for every single case out there. So we will have a separate a specialized algorithm to determine intersection volume uh, between two spheres. You will have another algorithm uh, to detect intersection volume between a sphere and a capsule. You will even end up with an algorithm which uh, checks the intersection volume between the sphere and the main part of the capsule, which is cylinder, and the sphere and the upper and left part of the capsule, which is caps. Uh, so uh, those pictures are taken from an actual guide that you can find on the internet and took like 20% uh, of all pictures. So you will end up with a lot and a lot of mess here. And this mess is just not fun to debug at all, believe me. Uh, but after this, we kind of done. Let's discuss uh, collision volumes once again, because uh, we use collision volumes in order to understand what is a reasonable decision to make on this collision. But if you think about it, using volumes to decide anything is like not feasible. How do you even do this volume just to volume? And um, uh, instead of using volumes, we will sample a few points from this volume. And I will give you a spoiler to the next step. So here we have a cube, which is lying on a plane. And let's imagine that cube is just slightly colliding with it, so its bottom part is under the plane, so we have a collision volumes, which is volume which is located on the, uh, on the bottom of the cube. And uh, what we will uh, do in a step two, in order to resolve this collision. It uh, will sample four points uh, from this volume. Those points are highlighted in red. We will attach an invisible string to each point, and then we will pull the object, the point, uh, up. So first of all, we will pull, for example, up a left point, and this point will go up, it start floating around uh, above the plane, so this collision will be resolved, but three other points will still be under it. Then we pull second point, third point, fourth point, and after we do that, a cube will be just lifted up, it will have no rotation at all, and this collision will be resolved. So, uh, yeah, uh, after we find the collision volume, our goal is to sample points from it. You may ask how many points and what exactly those points should like. And the answer to the first question is you, you should sample four points. Just trust me, if you open any physics engine out there, it will sample four points from uh, intersection volume. So, uh, so you should do it as well. Uh, four points are enough to resolve any kind of collision. Uh, and those points should be spread apart as much as possible. So if you sample four points from a right side, of uh, this box, when you pull it up, only the right side of the box will be lifted up. Uh, so we kind of want to have points on both edges. And in order to do that, you again have to do some math, and you also need to have some luck, because no math will guarantee you. Um, yeah, and there's more hack to make it more stable, uh, but hopefully I got the point. By the way, those points are called collision points, so what we sample from uh, intersection volume are collision points. Uh, okay, and now we're completely done with step one. Now we know the pairs of intersection, intersecting objects, and we know exactly how to fix those intersection because we have a collision point for each pair. Now let's go uh, to fixing step, our second step. Uh, and let's quickly discuss what requirements do we have for fixing this stuff. So in order to fix joints, pretty simple, just need to pull objects away, maybe rotate them, nothing too complicated. In order to fix collision, in order to uh, fix your player which is stuck on the wall, you should just move player out of the wall. So very simple stuff, nothing too complicated. But we have more requirements here. We have collisions and uh, we have bouncing, sorry. And bounciness in physics engine is implemented via collision. So here you have a ball, ball is going down, it meets the surface and bounces off. So the way it implemented, when ball is in the up, 
uh, colliding with the surface, we not only need to move it, to lift it up, to resolve this collision, we only need to redirect its velocity, to make it bounce. And uh, we also have friction, which is implemented kind of similar. So when your ball is sliding across the plane, it usually just slightly collides with it, so just one millimeter. And when you, when you detect that, your goal is to slow down this, uh, this object so to simulate friction, so it eventually stops. Okay, now we have all the requirements. Let uh, examine the approaches we can take to fix stuff. And the first approach is to teleport stuff. And teleportation works perfectly fine for uh, resolving collision because you can just teleport your player out of the wall to resolve joints, also perfectly fine. But unfortunately, uh, it won't work for bounces and friction because in order to make bounces and friction work, you need to change the velocity. Mm -hmm. And you can change the velocity with teleportation, you can only change position. So this is a very useful approach, but it won't work in our case. But, spoiler alert, if your physics engine doesn't need to have a velocity, just go with it, it's the best one. Uh, next, forces. Forces kind of works because you can simulate bounce and friction with forces, so you can apply some force to make object bounce. If your object is sliding, you can ap apply the force in the opposite direction of the velocity and ball will eventually stop sliding. In order to resolve collisions with force, uh, you kind of can do it. You can apply force uh, to your ball, which is stuck in the wall. But when ball will eventually move out, but then it will just continue moving because there is nothing to stop it. Uh, maybe it falls on the floor and friction will do the rest, but it won't look too good. Uh, and what we can do with it? Well, nothing. We just can say, hey, this is our reality and this is a reality of any physics engine. So, okay, let's just forget about that. Uh, can we use force to resolve all the stuff? Unfortunately not. And the reason for that is uh, forces are extremely complicated to deal with. It's hard to combine forces, it's uh, hard uh, to calculate them, especially rotational forces. Uh, forces also lead to uh, excessive energy, so when you pull your object from the wall, you're giving them it excessive energy because you applied forces to it. Uh, ideally, you just should teleport stuff and there will be no excessive energy, but in the case of force, here it is. So your simulation will eventually turn into chaos. So uh, we only left with a third option, and the third option is velocity. Velocity is similar to force, uh, you can still simulate balance and friction with velocity, kind of fine, just reduce velocity, here you go, friction. Uh, you can also resolve a case uh, where object is stuck in something using the velocity. You can just move it, you apply velocity and eventually your object will pop up. If you apply a little velocity, your object will just slowly move out the wall, it will be very annoying. If you apply great velocity, big velocity, sorry, uh, your object will just fly out and users will definitely notice it. So uh, you kind of make this a uh, user prob problem by allowing user to configure it. So any game engine out there have a parameter called the penetration velocity. And this is just magic constant that uh, tells us how fast we should resolve collision using the velocity. Uh, and velocities are much easier to deal with, and velocities doesn't lead to so much chaos in simulations, still lead to chaos, but not as much as forces. So, we will use velocity, and I will reiterate that, that we will use velocity just by just changing velocity, uh, to simulate everything, to resolve everything, to simulate every law of physics, to resolve all the collision, to resolve all the joints, just by changing velocity of the object. And let's briefly discuss uh, what we will get until we, when we implement physics engine uh, which just using velocity. We will get that. Everything will be moving and excessive energy will be everywhere. 
So let's take an example, a book, which is right, uh, located on the table uh, in the center of the room. And let's imagine that book is just slightly climbing the table. So what we're going to do is we're going to push it away, lift it up using the velocity. It would fly away for one or two frames. After that, it will fall down on the uh, table again. After that, we will still move it, lift it away, and we will do it for every frame. Just keep moving back and forth, back and forth. Uh, this movement is very slow, and user just won't notice it. But it's there, and physics engine will deal with it. So, how we resolve it? Again, throw some hacks, trim excessive velocity, making body slip, won't go into any details on that. Uh, but yeah, you should keep this in mind. Okay, now, fixing stuff, implementation part. Uh, you may ask, okay, now we know exactly what is wrong, exactly how to fix it, and we have even the understanding of what instruments velocity will be used to fix and stuff. How should we approach this? Should we fix joint first? Should we first solve the collision? Or maybe we should solve the collision of heavy object or light object? And the answer to that is, uh, well, let's just solve everything together. Uh, and in order to solve something, uh, we will use a simple trick of linear inequations. So, simple example of ball which is stuck inside the floor. We want it to go up with the penetration velocity, because the penetration velocity is the velocity we use to resolve the collision. In order to do that, we will write a simple linear equation that new velocity of this, um, of this circle should be greater or equal to the penetration velocity. If our world satisfies this uh, linear equation, this constraint, our ball will, sh should, uh, will start moving up. And eventually, the, uh, uh, this collision will be resolved. Uh, just a slight note, uh, we won't be dealing with objects here, we will be dealing with contact points. So in this case, we have four contact points, which are sampled from collision volume, and we will lift each point individually. But uh, even if we do so, every point will ge get the same lift, so object will be lifted as a whole. Okay, next case, bounciness. So in order to fix bounciness, we will throw in another linear equation on the bottom. We will write that new velocity of the body, of the contact point, should be greater or equal to the old velocity, but in the opposite direction. So, if this constraint is satisfied, the ball will go up with a velocity which is similar to the previous velocity, but in the opposite direction. It is, it is. Uh, friction also can be implemented. Uh, we need to have two inequalities for that. We won't go into in any details, but we want to constrain its velocity along each axis. So, what we are going uh, going to write here is that new velocity should be lower than old velocity multiplied by friction factor. And friction factor goes up uh, when friction goes down, so uh, if your friction is greater than we slow down, uh, uh, slow down this object more, uh, and so on. And the last part of joints. Joints are also pretty simple, so we want to pull our object together. So we tell that new velocity should be joint resolution velocity, which is just the penetration uh, velocity but for joint, uh, multiplied by evaluation modifier, and evaluation modifier becomes greater when evaluation is greater. So if we have like two objects that should be 5 meters apart, and they are 150 meters apart. We want to pull them together with greater velocity, uh, compared to the case when they are just six meters apart. And uh, that's it. We have a bunch of linear equations. What we're going to do is to solve them. Well, approximately, because we don't have time to solve it precisely, and we use uh, algorithms that allow us to uh, solve using iteration, and we usually do like five or six iterations on this system of linear equations. And this parameter is also configurable, you can find in any game engine out there, it's called uh, solder iteration or, or something like that. 
or we may even fail to solve this system at all. For example, if you have an elephant in the room, and the elephant is too big, and it's colliding with the ceiling and the floor at the same time. So ceiling is uh, telling us that elephant should go down, and floor is telling us, us that elephant should go up. Those inequations contradict each other, and you can just not solve it at the same time. So what we're going to do in this case? Well, nothing again. Uh, we'll just allow it to happen. Usually the last inequation wins, so if we process uh, floor first and ceiling second, ceiling will win and your elephant will go down. It just cannot rely on that. And we're done. Now we have new velocities. And uh, our third step, which is extremely easy. We have velocity, we have time, multiply it, move object away, you're done. And let's just reiterate on what we just did. So here a block lying on the surface. Our narrow phase uh, will, our, sorry, our broad phase will report that we have a, one pair of colliding objects, block and a surface. Uh, then our narrow phase will calculate intersection volume between those pairs of objects. And it will sample four collision points from it. And those points will be located, hopefully, at the edges of the block. Then we will write one linear equation for each point, And this equation will force this point to go up to resolve collision. If we have bounciness, we will write additional equation, which forces our point to go up with the velocity which, which is opposite to what we have previously. If we have uh, friction, we will have to write two additional linear equations for each point to slow it down to prevent it from moving at all. So in this case, we will have 14, uh, 16, sorry, linear equation, and we will solve them using like six iteration. Uh, we will get new velocities, we will apply them, and just move stuff. So this is uh, need to be done just to keep this object from moving to lying flat on the plane. And uh, usually have thousands of objects that interact in some weird ways. So uh, next time you play your favorite game and you see some weird bug or glitch with physics, just remember it's not because your physics engine is bad, it's just because it needs to do so much stuff in so little time, it doesn't have any chance, chance to do anything properly. Yeah, and now we have pretty decent physics engine, but there is more stuff that we can explore, uh, like hair simulation, clothes simulation, water simulation, you name it. And I won't go into any details here, but uh, just remember, as we already discussed, this is not a rocket science, it's just a bunch of hacks to which are coupled together to make things look good. And this is it. Thank you for your patience.